Above are domes of color. Watercolor shines in translucent flows. Plant pigments mediate the living metamorphosis of sunlight to gentle color. Rudolf Steiner gave the recipes for the paints. Volunteers ground them for a hundred hours in the sunlight for light fastness. It is the first time plant colors have been used on this scale. They glow gently in the subdued light in the interior of the Goetheanum. The fundamental coloring in great sweeps is something like this. Surrounding the audience's shared backspace, a wide bow of blue can be felt, opening receptively, listening. Into this, from the frontal event source, streams red, parting in a flow form, breathing out into yellow. Into the rainbow colors of the day spectrum, something of the spiritual night spectrum of the small dome turns inside out above the stage opening, dissolving the outward spatial quality of the rainbow colors in the inwardness of peach blossom. Conversely, an influx of rainbow in the small dome lets the two worlds belong together. Within the color flows of the great dome, images take shape. Three in the west, three in the east, a matching pair in north and south, and a set of four around the middle. The whole composition forms a cross and a circle. Gerard Wagner discovered that they are all one motif, passing through the colors of the rainbow and changing in keeping with whatever color it is immersed in. Into this basic color first come condensations of black and brown, image colors. These cause luster colors, such as blue and red, to assume shape. Here, for instance, the first colors, black and brown, float in the blue of the curved surface, carrying each other. Here, by comparison, the enhanced, warmer blue has the strength to draw the black and the brown up and out, as Peter Stebbing has noted. The periphery works in more directly. In the green, the black comes to the middle and opens upward to the light. The brown forms lesser centers of weight opening the composition laterally and forming fuel for the columns of red. In the far west, a violet supports the blue. Blue with violet below is the environment of the first image. The violet allows a gathering of substance the blue, an outbreathing of space. Into that, 
you are supposed to paint something like this. Rudolf Steiner gave the sketch to show loosely what you should end up with. But with him, the assignment is always to develop the image from the artistic necessity of the color dynamics. Nobody got what that meant, so the results were disappointing. Hence, there are hardly any photographs. Also, Rudolf Steiner did not have all the colors needed for the sketch. Also, people didn't always take his sketches seriously because they thought he couldn't draw. But in fact, he could. The arc near the bottom indicates the violet area. Two classes of beings collaborate, asymmetrical and symmetrical, their heads surrounded by wavy and angular auras in cool colors and in warm, their hands working with rays of warm colors and of cool, which reach into the zone above the surface of the earth and the zone below, the rays spreading and focusing, bringing about life and form. The black is held fast in the violet, like script. From primordial depths, creator powers stimulate first condensations of form. To the side, the beings of light receive, with the left hand, the red-yellow pulse from the heights, transform it and ray it to the earth, engendering there the plant growth. This outward manifesting above the curve is called in the book of Genesis the heavens. The inward stirring below the curve is called the earth. Where the rays cross, the organ of sight arises as form. The world comes to be out of darkness, light, and color. We carry these images of creation and of earthly evolution in us. They appear when the ether body is freed from the head organism, expanded to a cosmos and be held from within. The next image arises in the blue zone with green above. Therefore, the blue condenses around a small black mark to a focused shape. The red, on the other hand, expands out of a brown and partly softens into yellow. These colors reverse in the periphery, blue on the left, diffuse red and yellow on the right. In the middle, a light blue gently mediates. Blue beings in front of the red ear send red rays over to the eye. Red beings in front of the blue eye send rhythmical blue vibrations to the ear. The beings are themselves thoughts of the second hierarchy, that is, of the sun. The tone beings are higher, as their wings show. 
in the gaze of the eye, the intensely present divine selfhood, in the listening of the ear, the gentle selflessness. Between the concentration and the empathy, our whole humanity comes to be. Thus beneath these great archetypal organs lies the figure of man. This second motif develops the life level with polarity, tension, two opposite currents in the etheric genesis of the senses as great archetypes above man. Doubling the motif puts the eyes outside, the ears inside and deeper. The eye perceives the outer, the ear the inner quality. Listening involves sympathy and the will to understand. Seeing requires a more distanced confrontation and examination. Here the background is green, in which earthly man can feel at home. The red forms within the green an inner space. Enveloped in this shimmering fullness of twilight, a gnarled black stands in the middle, rooted in the red. It takes the shape of a tree of death with a serpent body coiled around its branches. This astral being is also endowed with an eye, as its countenance shows. Lucifer works upon our head and spinal marrow, hence he is represented as serpent with a human head. The prevalent symmetry is disturbed by Lucifer, also by the distinction of male and female. The moment she takes the fruit, the flame of egohood kindles. Two pillars of fire flare up behind the two people, minded by two blue angels. The red obtrudes with Lucifer. The blue retreats with Yahweh, or Jehovah, the opponent of Lucifer. Peach blossom shows the breath of soul. In one of his lectures on color, delivered facing this part of the Goetheanum ceiling, Rudolf Steiner made a remark which obviously applies to this image. He pointed out that red strengthens green, blue weakens green, peach blossom stands neutrally in green. Here the red luciferic intensifies the perception of earthly creation. The blue Yahweh and his angels damp it. The blue recedes, and a haze begins to separate man and God. That is because when egohood began to work in the astral body, because of Lucifer in paradise, the physical body shrank as a result. Our awareness was pressed out 
into the world through openings that became our sense organs. As the book of Genesis says, then their eyes were opened. The karma of the Luciferic temptation is arimanic error and death. Here hinted at in the hardening of the tree. The first motif concerns the form of the sense organs. The second, the life of the sense organs, the play of forces. The third, the consciousness of the sense organs, the interest in the sensory world. The creation motifs begin out of the wide blue background, then gradually concentrate to the red triangle throning above. Opposite them, in the west-east axis, are three prominent motifs showing the spiritual situation of our own time. Within the red, which itself is already the center of greatest intensity in the ceiling, the color concentrates all the way to black. This in turn calls for light and a cool color. Now it is awake. The I am, self-aware, meets us. In red, as Rudolf Steiner points out, we can experience divine wrath and learn to pray. And Goethe, writing on the moral effects of colors, says a glass tinted purple red shows a well-illumined landscape in a fearsome light so must the color tone be spread over earth and sky on the day of judgment. Divine love, with its warmth, spiritualizes the earth. Divine wrath condenses what must fall away. The lower black hardens and asserts its own contour. From the sphere of the earth, the inner red and yellow flame up as the force of human selfhood, tended by angels from the rose-violet world of mercy and desired by Ariman, his hands want to take, theirs to give. Three angels with wings descending, the two on the other side ascending. These two directions together make the rhythmy gesture for the language sound E. Organs of consciousness form in the heights, of will in the depths. All is pervaded by warmth of feeling. God's hands carry the world, even the adversary. The fiery column of selfhood was enkindled under the influence of Lucifer 
in the paradise picture. Here, the same column of fire undergoes the arimanic karma of the Luciferic temptation. The two pictures have corresponding positions in the ceiling. Within the basic color of lavender, the yellow is carried. The reddish gives it a self-sustaining middle. The whole shines as if from the realm of the sun, as William Scott Pyle says. The formative influence of the fine traces of black or gray in the inner zone and brown in the surrounding figures is but delicate. The eye, as man's middle region, needs to feel free. After the concentrated black of the previous picture, here the pulsing, the enthusiasm, the earnest flaming gaze of this countenance is in league with the Archangel of the Sun and with the Guardian shown in the red window. The Leonine aspect suggests the heart region, the feeling eye, yet radiant with light that is just as clear as it is warm. The hearts begin to have thoughts. Red, with its strong feeling of self, becomes transparent and engages with the surroundings. The heart opens. The life of feeling becomes an organ of perception. The first three angels move mostly within the yellow, the last three dipping more into the reddish. Below, a connection is hinted at between the seventh and the first. The middle one is the most independent. These beings spring from sun powers a gown of rays from the thinking of the gods. Together they make it the Eurythmy gesture for the vowel AH. The first and last of this West-East series were the first motifs that Rudolf Steiner sketched. The basic color of the last one, peach blossom, is, with variations, the color of human incarnation. Here, it appears in the periphery. Earthly man, with his central consciousness, is dissolved and turned inside out. He unfolds as twelve-fold peripheral eye. In the middle, conversely, the color is emptied. The red, too, 
is flipped to the outside. It delivers directional impulses from the circumference. It becomes arms of will, as Torsten Steen calls them, members of the higher self working from without in karma. The black in the lower left anchors the picture. The faces are people who have died and are spiritually connected with the building. Sophie Stinde, Theo Feiss, Christian Morgenstern. Seven of the faces are lighter, five darker. Together they make the Eurythmy gesture for O. It is below this dramatic image that the curtain opens to show in the mystery dramas the destiny connections. Far to the left and right, in the wide expanses of green, images of past evolution spread out. Here, the red comes from the right. Tension is building. In a drama, characters approaching from the spectator's right exert power. Therefore black and brown pile up resistance. The black and brown find their appropriate area below, allowing the luster colors above to take on shapes. The resulting color harmony of overwhelming red and thick yellow gives a hot and dense atmosphere. Below, mighty kelp-like plants pervade the greenish-brown ooze. This, plus the various saurians, coincides with Rudolf Steiner's descriptions of the later phase of Gondwana land, known in those days as Lemuria, when the condition of the earth corresponded to the organically interwoven condition of substances in our digestive system. Goethe, too, speaks of a thicker atmosphere, impregnated with mineral components, electromagnetically charged, working upon the earth in heat and fermentation, even capable of bursting into flames. Amid this heat, the bluish-violet forms the upright capacity of the countenance, working in from a realm of higher beings. From the countenances 
formative forces stream toward two men to be. The pineal gland of these two juts out of an open head. The limbs are still rudimentary. These ancestors of man have less defined contours than the animals, who by fixing their form must go extinct. The picture can be read from left to right, with the red breaking in out of the future. The approaching cataclysm of fire will end the Lemurian era. If you continue and turn all the way to the right, you see the next main era. How mild the color harmony after Lemuria. Here the red comes from the left. The fire cataclysm is past. Tension releases so that black and brown loosen. The dark yellow gives way to a lightened yellow. In the brown, the earth comes to rest in a calmer shape. From the right comes green. Where the lion is, the red still works in. The animal types below appear as group soul organs of the winged consciousness above, whose more spiritual colors reappear below in the Ice Age cave of Atlantean man. His head, though not as open as it was in Lemuria, still continues in currents. In Lemuria, Humanity evolves on the mountain, in Atlantis, in the cave, the subterranean place of the ancient mysteries. Below the second angel, human souls return from their sojourn in the planetary spheres as the earth becomes habitable. The four images of the post-Atlantean cultural epochs circle, opening somewhat toward the E-A-O above the threshold to the stage. In the warm colors, the brown, itself warm, spreads evenly as an oval surface of human incarnation color. The resulting face is calmly immersed in an eternal flow, in a mood of oneness. Upward, the inner and the outer are at one. Downward, there is a shadowy separation from the earthly daylight, above which prehistoric Indian man hovers. He does not feel enclosed in his head, but open to inspiration from above, receiving the light of consciousness from the seven rishis mentioned in the Rig Veda. They mediate in the orange zone. Above each of them in the red 
is the planetary spirit of one of the seven Atlantean oracles. The Sun Initiate is the middle one, who brings the turning. The ancient Indian longed to return to the heavenly world. A statuette from the ancient Indus Valley civilization shows similar features. In primitive cultures, red is the first or only color named. Little children, too, perceive red first and only later the cooler colors. The pictures of the cultural epochs show the evolution of color consciousness as a passage through the rainbow. In the second, the background color is red above and orange below. Between the two, a dualistic space opens up, with a dynamic diagonal partition. The light is ensouled with peach blossom. The darkness floods in from the right, threatening from the future with seven winged black beings, chief among them the demon of the sun, stirring up eddies of turbulence around the edge. It is the last cultural epoch before the Dark Age, Kali Yuga. Light and darkness are still experienced etherically, as animated by beings the prehistoric Persian, this time confronting the world in profile, lives with his upper part in light, his lower touched by darkness. His human incarnation color appears outside him no longer in seven, but focused in one the great initiate, Zarathustra, who stands at the boundary, clothed in bright royal purple, crowned in gold. He illumines the consciousness, this time with his hand. The Persian is no longer immersed in abiding unity. A rip passes through his experience of the world, a duality, a battle. He radiates will. His flashing blue eye, possibly faded in the sketch, looks straight ahead. The beard emphasizes the chin, the resolve. Zarathustra stands in the battle between light and darkness himself between Ahriman and Ahura Mazda. Dauntless, the Persian looks toward the battle.
Amid the bright yellow light, the ancient Egyptian turns inward. With the inwardness of his incarnation color, with his dark, warm eyes. At the threshold to the inner life, the incarnation color heats up to red, forming a bestial version of the head and spine, but sprawling, without uprightness. Outside, below red lightning, the spirits of darkness grasp at the mystery of the human physical body, shown as a mummy. Between that nocturnal region of spiritual reality and the light of day, a middle zone in brown mediates as the world of art. The Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara, Egypt's oldest, showed the sevenfold ascent of the soul after death through the planetary spheres. And the incarnation color in the outer world now appears as Sphinx, confronting man with the riddle of his own being. The green is still beyond his ken. In the Hellenic cultural epoch, man stands sovereign in classical contrapposto, surveying creation from atop the mountain, finally awakening to an actual landscape. He overcomes the Sphinx, but only on the surface of his consciousness by answering the riddle of man with his newly developing intellect, he casts the Sphinx into the abyss, that is, into himself. In the depths, it oppresses him. Not until around the turn of the ages does the perception of green become generally possible. In the first epoch, the red works from above and beyond. In the second, it touches man from behind. In the third, it enters him. In the fourth, he himself can emit red. The blue of these divine beings recedes. In the post-Atlantean era, they have vanished. Their active red works on. In the Hellenic epoch, the divine reappears as man on earth. The blue of the divine countenance incarnates, making the free stance possible and becoming individual. And what has become of the human incarnation color? It now ensouls the earth. 